I told myself this week I was just gonna do a nice three to five minute video on the Battle of Bayonet Hill. Quick, easy, super short, it was gonna be great. And then I Googled the guy that was in command during the Battle of Bayonet Hill and everything just spiraled out of control from there and it is now his video. Today we're talking about the man that the US government had to order to quit leading bayonet charges against the enemy during the Korean War. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Lewis Lee Millet. And let me tell you something, this is the first picture that pops up when you Google him, and it's exactly why everything spiraled out of control. Because first of all, I mean, let's just call out the elephant in the room. That is the most immaculate face foliage I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, look at that womb broom, it's perfect. And then you look down a little and you're like, oh hey, He's got two bayonets because he like fought on Bayonet Hill. That's really cool. And then you look over and you're like, oh, wow. Younger him was awesome too with dual pineapple grenades on his shoulders. And then it dawns on you. Oh shit, this guy's wearing the Medal of Honor around his neck. And it's like the fourth thing I noticed. Okay, do you have any idea how badass you have to be to be wearing the Medal of Honor and it be the fourth thing that I noticed? Don't worry, I'm gonna tell you right after this ad. This video is brought to you by Zydax. Custom gaming PCs are all built right here in America with American tech support. It's what I use to do all my research and make these videos and all the copious amounts of scripture I read. What? Link description, moving on. Our story begins December 15th, 1920, when a baby would be born, presumably with a mustache by the name of Louis Millette. He would spend his childhood growing up in Mechanic Falls, Maine, where his family would hunt and grow their own food just to survive the Great Depression. So naturally, this kid's gonna grow up to be a pretty tough guy. Fast forward to 1938, he gets done with school and he wants to carry on his family's military legacy, but here's the thing, it's 1938. World War II's not gonna kick off until 1939 when Germany invades Poland, and even then, America's not gonna get involved until after Pearl Harbor at the very, very end of 1941. So since the US military didn't have a whole lot going on at this point in time and no real big prospects on the horizon that we knew about yet, he decided he was just gonna join the main Army National Guard, get trained up and be ready in case his country did need him. So he heads out for training, goes through basic, gets that done. Now it's time to figure out what his actual job's gonna be so he can head off to specialty training. But at this point in time, you didn't get to pick. But I mean, let's be real. He's an 18 year old kid. He's rough, he's tough. He grew up during the Great Depression. Obviously, they're just gonna throw him into infantry or like combat engineer, artillery, some type of combat MOS, right? Wrong. So the army looks at his transcript from high school and they're like, hey, you took keyboarding in high school. That's awesome. We need a bunch of male clerks in the army. And typically we have to teach them from scratch because none of the young boys take keyboarding in high school because at this point in time, it's seen as like a female related job task because it's the 1930s and like 99.9% .9 of all secretaries are female. And those are really the only people that need to know how to type. So you already have this skill set. That's perfect. We're just gonna make you a clerk. And now Millet's pissed off because he has zero interest in being a clerk. He's never had an interest in keyboarding. The only reason he took that class in high school is because that's where all the future hot secretaries were and that mustache isn't gonna sit on itself, now is it? So obviously Millet gets told, hey, the army doesn't really care what you want. You're going to clerk school anyways. So he goes, knocks it out because well, he already knows how to type. It's not that big of a deal. Gets back home, it's now 1939. All the news starts coming out that Germany has invaded Poland. Jewish people are fleeing Germany due to increasing mistreatment and he sees that war is coming on the horizon. And he absolutely does not want to be stuck being a clerk in World War II. So he decides that he's going to ditch the National Guard and he's going to join the full-time Army Air Corps, which at this point in time is the equivalent of the Air Force. So he pretty much immediately gets turned around and heads right back to training. Thankfully, he's already done basic training. So now he just goes straight to gunnery school. He gets done with that. It's now 1940 and he is chomping at the bit to get involved with this war. And Millet's absolutely the odd man out with this because Pearl Harbor hasn't had happened yet and the vast majority of America wants absolutely nothing to do with another European war after World War One. Millet doesn't just want to get involved because he's some crazy warmonger that thinks it's going to be fun. He actually truly believes that fighting in World War Two is the right thing to do. I mentioned that his family had a proud military history and it goes all the way back. His ancestors came over to America as indentured servants where they basically worked as slaves for seven years to pay off the debt for their voyage to the new world so that they could have their freedoms. And ever since then, every man in Millet's family has fought to preserve those freedoms. His family fought in the American Revolutionary War. Both of his great grandfathers fought for the North in the Civil War, and now he deems it as his turn. So you see, he didn't just join the military because he wanted to fight for America. He wanted to fight for what America actually stood for. He's basically the American equivalent of William Wallace. They'll never take Freedom. So in 1940, when the president at the time, FDR, came out in a speech and basically said, hey, America is not actually going to fight in World War II. We're just going to send over a bunch of guns and bullets and they can fight it themselves. The people of Europe who are defending themselves do not ask us 
to do their fighting. They ask us for the implements of war, the planes, the tanks, the guns, the freighters, which will enable them to fight for their liberty and our security. At this point, Millet's like, fuck it. If America's not going to fight, I am. He abandons his post hitchhikes to Canada and joins the Canadian Army. He then proceeds to go into training for a third time to become an artilleryman in the Canadian Army, gets done with that, shipped over to Britain, just in time to partake in the Blitz. Which, if you don't know, is when Germany began launching air raids against Great Britain, and Millet was there the entire time performing anti-aircraft operations to help defend Great Britain. Fast forward December 8th, 1941, the attack on Pearl Harbor happens. The next day, December 9th, FDR declares war on Japan, and two days after that, December 11th, Germany declares war on America, at which point Millet is like, hot damn. Millet then immediately makes his way to the US Embassy, re-signs up for the US military, and they ship him down to North Africa to take out the Desert Fox, Erwin Rommel. And you gotta keep in mind, after training with the Canadians and then fighting with them for almost a year, Millet is one of, if not the most experienced combat veterans in the army at this point in time, because everybody else is either a brand new kid that volunteered or got drafted. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you he's gonna have to dad dick this entire situation because he's surrounded by a bunch of noobs. For example, he would earn himself a silver star star. Because one day, all the new guys got together and they had a brilliant idea. They had a truck that was full of artillery ammunition and grenades and they said, you know what? We should cover it in hay for camouflage. It worked in Looney Tunes, you know? Wiley Coyote was able to sneak up on the Roadrunner, almost, because he hid inside of a hay bale. This is going to be brilliant. So, I'm going to say it again but slower. They took all their ammunition in the truck and covered it in hay in literally the driest region on the planet. So then the next time they get into a firefight, the tracers from the enemy machine gun fire hits the hay, catches the hay on fire because obviously, and all the new guys are like, oh God, what do we do? What do we do? All our ammunition's on fire now. Maybe wrapping it in flammable shit in the desert wasn't a good idea. So the fire continues to grow and then it gets hot enough that it starts cooking off all the rounds and all the ammunition starts exploding in the back of the truck and now it's putting everybody in danger. So naturally, the new guys freeze up and adopt the gun door defense strategy. So then Sergeant Millet at this point is just watching this utter chaos unfold like... Goddamn kids. So he gets up, he runs over to the truck, jumps inside, starts it, floors it. He just takes off towards the enemy. All the ammunition in the back is exploding behind him. This is complete chaos. He gets up to speed, opens the door, and bails out and just lets the truck go towards the enemy. And the entire thing ends up blowing up. Millet then crawls his way back in the middle of this firefight, gets back to his men, and they continue to fight because he has effectively saved himself and a bunch of other people. You know, typical big beard behavior. Prepare for battle. And that's just one example. He also earned a bronze star when his convoy got attacked by a Messerschmitt that dropped down to do a strafing run and shoot everybody with machine guns. And everybody ran away, per usual. And he has to run over. He jumps on the anti-aircraft gun on the back of a half track. And he ends up shooting down a German Messerschmitt, which is... An unbelievable thing to pull off. He then continues to fight all the way through the rest of North Africa, pushing the enemy out of the entire continent, and now it's time for him to go fight in Italy. He participates in four amphibious landings at the Battle of Anzio and Salerno. Then, after six months of fighting in Italy and six months of fighting all the way through North Africa, his paperwork finally catches up to him, and the big army is like, hey, you deserted your post like two and a half years ago. You're fired. Yeah, full court-martial completely kicked him out of the army. Then, without leaving the office when this paperwork got signed, he's like, hear me out, can I join the army now? And they're like, yes, yes you can. And since you have so much experience, you're going to be an officer. Here's your commission. You're now a lieutenant. So now Millet's kind of pumped. This whole thing was just a bunch of bureaucratic paperwork BS, and he got a promotion out of the deal. We're good to go. Everything's awesome. Then, the army, sensing happiness somewhere, decided that they had to destroy it. They jump in and they're like, hey! We're going to take all of your leave. You're not allowed to have leave ever again. We're taking all of it away. To which Millet kind of responded, I, I really don't care. Go ahead. The only time I've taken leave is when I left my post, joined the Canadian Army so I could get to this war sooner. I'm exactly where I want to be. Take all the leave. I do not care. To which the Army's like, 
we're gonna fine you $52. And when you adjust for inflation, $52 back then is like $1,000 by today's standards. Like it's not an insignificant amount of money. So Millet is obviously pretty thoroughly annoyed because he's not only now risking his life to do the right thing, he's actually incurring financial penalties. But ultimately he realizes he's not here for money. So he just goes back to work and continues fighting. He ends up spending the rest of the war fighting in Italy. After Germany surrenders, he makes his way back home, rejoins the National Guard, and then he attempts to go to college. So he gets three years into a four-year degree. He's almost done with college. And then June 25th, 1950, North Korea wakes up one morning and chooses violence. They decide they're going to invade South Korea, kicking off the Korean War. Now, to be fair, most people in this situation, a veteran of the Canadian Army, as well as the United States Army, and highly decorated, you would assume would probably want to finish up that four-year degree before they go into combat again, if they wanted to go into combat at all but not Lewis Millet. Now, this is America's William Wallace. All he had to hear is that a bunch of communists were attacking a free democratic nation and... Oh, so that's how you're gonna play it. You're gonna do this? Okay, fine. That's all I needed. And it, it became personal with me. So Millet shows up in Korea. He starts working as a forward observer. If you don't know, a forward observer is the guy that goes out finds the enemy, calls in their coordinates so that they can hit him with artillery. Millet being Millet calls in the artillery a little bit too close to himself and gets hit with some shrapnel. So now that he's injured, he kind of has to take a deep breath, step back, evaluate the situation, come to grips with the fact that he's only mortal and accept that he's just going to have to fall back behind the front line and recover. I'm just kidding. He demands that the army give him an airplane and a pilot so that he can hop in this plane injured and call in artillery fire on the enemy from a fucking crop duster. And then, because that wasn't gangster enough, December 5th, 1950, a P-51 Mustang goes down behind enemy lines in North Korea. So, naturally, Millet and his pilot get up in the air. They're gonna go find him. And somehow, they manage to pull it off. They land on the ground next to the plane. They pick up the pilot. The only problem, this crop duster only seats two people. So so Millet, still injured by the way, is like, don't worry about it. Go ahead, take my seat. The plane's gonna go faster without my titanic sized balls weighing it down anyways. I'll just hang out here, evade capture from the enemy that's for sure looking for the downed P-51 Mustang by now. And then uh, you guys can just come back and pick me up whenever. Yep. So that's what happened. They take the other pilot back. Millet evades capture all night long. The pilot picks him back up the next morning. And then uh, he makes his way back, has a full recovery. And then by February 1951, he's ready to get back doing real dangerous stuff again. You know, combat. So they give him a promotion to captain and then give him his own platoon of infantry that he's going to lead into battle. Shortly after taking over this platoon, he intercepts enemy correspondence that says that the Americans are afraid of bayonets and close quarters combat, which is the funniest communist propaganda on the planet because you know all these Chinese and North Korean communists were sitting around like, man, how come these Americans have so many bullets? It's like they never run out like we do all the time. And the communist leadership's like, Ugh. um, uh, it's, uh, it's because the Americans are afraid to fix bayonets and fight you guys close quarters like men. That's why they just keep shooting you. It's definitely not because capitalism's better and it can provide them with enough ammunition to actually win a fight. That's definitely not it. Okay, and at this point in the story, you absolutely have to remember that Millet trained with and was in the Canadian Army in the very early days of World War II. And at that point in time, everybody just assumed that World War II was going to be reminiscent of World War I, a bunch of trench warfare. Meaning that Millet probably trained in how to conduct trench warfare with the Canadians. And if you don't know, the Canadians were absolutely terrifying in World War I. They were absolutely absolute savages in close quarters trench warfare. These guys wrote the book on how to not only be good at it, but play dirty the entire time. They were known for taking cans of food, throwing it into the enemy trench, and then when they heard all the enemies run up to pick up the food, they would throw grenades in right after it, okay? Don't let the good manners and the accent and the maple syrup fool you. The entire first rough draft of the Geneva Convention is pretty much just a laundry list of shit the Canadians did during World War I. And that is who trained Lewis Millet in how to engage in close quarters combat and the commies just said that he was scared of it. So naturally, he took that as a challenge and began training his entire platoon every day in how to bayonet fight. So then the next time Millen's platoon comes across the enemy, fix bayonets, charge. They do it, they completely wipe out the enemy altogether. Only problem, they wiped out all of the enemy and now there's nobody left to tell all the communists that America's not scared of bayonet fighting. I guess we're just gonna have to do it again. Fast forward a little bit, Millet, his platoon, and two other platoons are trying to take Hill 180. One of the platoons goes to maneuver around to a flank and they end up getting pinned down by heavy machine gun fire. The other two platoons are like, oh shit, what do we do? Millet just yells, fix bayonets, and starts charging up the hill. Just takes off. There's no ready, set, go. No one, two, three. He just goes. <laughs> 
So now Millet's platoon hurries up, fumbles around, gets their bayonets on, and they take off too, no questions asked. He's been training them this entire time. They've been around him enough to know this man's the main character, and they're ready to follow him to hell and back. So they start running after him. That other platoon is standing there like, oh shit, what do we do? Was that the mustache guy that already led a bayonet charge last month? I guess. So they take off as well. Millet at this point is running up this big ass hill and he's like 60 yards ahead of his guys and the grenades just start coming from the top of this hill and he's dodging these grenades one at a time. He dodges one, he dodges two, he dodges three and then his men behind him start trying to throw grenades up the hill and they do, they throw them way past him, but they start rolling down the hill towards him. So now he's dodging grenades from behind him and from in front of him. Eventually, like the ninth one ends up getting a lucky shot, hits him in the shins with some shrapnel, but kind of busy, I'll worry about that later. He continues to charge up the hill. Him and his men end up pushing back 300 communists off this hill and forcing them to retreat, completely fracturing their line. When the smoke settles, there's over 100 dead communists, 30 of them by bayonet. Now at this point, Millet needs to get medevaced, but he's got a couple things he has to do first. He's A, got to make sure that his men are squared away. He's not leaving until he makes sure of that. And then B, he's got to go over to what used to be the enemy commander and leave a bayonet in his chest with a letter that says compliments of easy company. So Millet gets medevaced, goes back, takes about a month off, gets fixed up, heads back to his company. And then first chance he gets, he leads another bayonet charge, at which point the U.S. government steps in and is like, dude, stop. Okay, we're already naming Hill 180 Bayonet Hill. We're giving you the Medal of Honor. We can't have you getting killed in one of these bayonet charges. You're no longer allowed to launch bayonet charges. That's it. No more. You're done. Fast forward to July 1951. He gets awarded the Medal of Honor by President Truman for the Battle of Bayonet Hill. He also gets awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for the other two bayonet charges that he led. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing a little here, but when he received the Medal of Honor, he basically said, this medal doesn't just belong to me. It belongs to all of my men as well, because without the other hundred men that had my back, I would have just been some crazy guy running up a hill to my death. All right, so just to recap, he served in two armies, he fought in two wars, he has the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, and the Bronze Star. It's probably time to retire, right? Wrong. He immediately transfers to the 101st Airborne, gets jump qualified, becomes a paratrooper. That wasn't hard enough, so he goes to Ranger School, like the hardest military school at this point in time, passes it absolutely no problem. So then he decides, hey, we got these helicopter things now and they can hover. I'm going to go ahead and try repelling out of one. Becomes the first man to ever repel out of a hovering helicopter, officially becoming the godfather of air assault. Then Vietnam kicks off and we really have no idea what he did because he was an advisor for the CIA, meaning he was mostly doing a bunch of extracurricular gangster shit that none of us are allowed to know about. After Vietnam, he would finally retire after 35 years in service, having earned the Medal of Honor, the Distinguished Service Cross, two Legions of Merit, the Silver Star, three Bronze Stars, four Purple Hearts, and three Air Medals. He would then go on to live happily ever after with his wife until passing away in 2009 at the age of 88. In conclusion, Colonel Louis Millet didn't just fight for America, he fought for what America stood for, and he was willing to stand for it even when America wasn't. And that is absolutely why this week's video has been about Colonel Louis Millet and not just the Battle of Bayonet Hill. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the video is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. And my records catch up when they court martial me for desertion, found me guilty, and they find me $52 fine and made me a second lieutenant. <laughs> The minute Louis Millette turned 18 years old, 1938, he would join the Maine Mas the Maine National Guard. Jesus Christ. Maine National Guard. National Maine Mainards Menards. Fuck. I've never met a bad soldier in combat. I'm alive today because I am damn good men. Huh? I get emotional about it. We're in a free country. And we are, why are we? Because a lot of people, black, white, yellow, went and gave their lives so that you and I can live free. Huh? Simple as that.